Texas Next Matters Most, uh, show on business, entrepreneurship, and technology. And I'm here with Lister Delgado. Uh, I think I'll get the title right, but managing partner, managing director yep. of- Managing uh, partner. Managing partner of Idea Fund Partners, um, a venture capital firm that focuses on, I'll let you actually tell it, but they're a, a VC, one of the original VCs here in the Triangle area. Um, I've known Lister for 10 or 11 years plus, well, maybe more if you count sort of the early soccer days, pre sort of overlapping and, and careers. Wow. Um, yeah, I guess let's just kick it off. I mean, there's no agenda. Um, we talk about kind of what you're working on, where things are going and that you see in your industry mm -hmm. and something that I think is important to the community and audience, which is sort of, you know, your journey and ex your experience share, right? So, I mean, obviously not everyone is in the VC track, but many people might relate to sort of how you got to where you are and, and, and how you're thinking about what you're thinking and why. So, um, yeah, man, I'll try to keep us on on track and yeah. uh, I'll kick it over to you. Sure. I'm happy to, to tell you a little bit more about uh, our firm and about myself. So I... Um, um, uh, as you said, I'm a managing partner of, a, of an early stage venture capital fund called Idea Fund Partners. We're based in Durham, although we're really virtual now. We have one partner in Charlotte, uh, Chris Langford, uh, and, and John Cambier and I are, are uh, well, actually, John is in Durham and I'm in Chapel Hill. And that's where we're working from, even though we have an office in, in uh, Durham. And uh, what we do is seed an early stage in technology. Um, and in a pretty broad sense, we we used to uh, we used to be very very focused on on particular technology sectors. But as we got a little bit bigger and and broader, we got you know a little bit broader in some areas. And it's it, and it's really always changing exactly what we do. So I know that this podcast is going to live forever. So we better stick with innovation and uh and 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 the uh and the strict sense of it so that it's meaningful and 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 it means something for a while and um so in terms of how i got to vc you want me to get into that now sure yeah go for it like pretty much everybody by chance um i was uh, uh an engineer for five years i worked at bell labs uh at and and lucent and did hardware design, software design, and I wanted to uh, get into uh, business and start a company and got to business school in Carolina. And uh, that's where I discovered venture capital. And I, I was there during an interesting time between 2000 and 2002, right after the internet bubble had burst. And crazy times because the whole world was sort of turning upside down, the world of venture capital and startups. And... Um, and what ended up happening was that basically uh, all the competition that I would have had normally went away because at that time, everybody who was looking for a new job or, or starting a new career, then suddenly forgot. I mean, didn't want anything to do with startups or venture capital. They wanted to just simply go through the safest jobs, the ones that they could find. 50% of my graduating class had no jobs when they graduated, which is unusual, hugely unusual. I mean, usually it's 98% of the business class, MBA class has a, has a job offer when they graduate. But that year, internet bubble bursting and all, uh, it was like that, 50%. And uh, which meant nobody really wanted to do with anything with startups. It was just too risky on top of the, the normal economic risk. But there was this fund started by what what is now the group that is now NC Idea? Um, it was called MCNC at the time. That was starting a venture fund because they had had a successful exit during the internet bubble peak. Um, so they had cash, looking for a technology driven uh, sort of recently minted MBA. John Cambier was sort of in charge of that group, and I was hired to. Um, kind of pushed my way in. But um, but again, it wasn't too tough because there was not much competition. Um, so it was just luck that uh, I think without the, the internet bubble bursting like that, I would have been just one of 50 people looking for looking to get into that job. And and, uh, and instead, it was probably the only one that, that cared. Uh, and, uh, and I've been there ever since. So that's kind of how I ended up in venture capital. Do you think kind of having the engineering background was sort of a good foot in the door? Like maybe that's oh, a yeah. good 
a path for others, like uh, have a skill that skill can be leveraged and, you know, on the entry level way, you've got more than just business sense. Um, and then, you know, you can grow into more of the portfolio management side from there. Yeah. Yeah. There's different ways to get into venture capital. Yeah. Um, it, one of them is through an MBA program. Uh, th- you, you get, you get, uh, because, because uh, there is, it's common that venture capital firms have interns they start to uh, they recruit from uh, business schools, uh, but 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 then you know when you're in business school, you look a lot like everybody else. So having an engineering degree helped me stand out, and and having being a uh, you know being a designer and, and doing software design and hardware design that made a difference for me to get this particular job. But it was through the MBA funnel that I got, I got in, right? Like uh, through, my, through my friends and connections at the MBA program. So, so it was a little bit of a combination of both. I think other people, you know, have gotten into business school uh, or rather venture capital through business school without an engineering degree. And that's perfectly fine. It depends on, on the kind of fund that you're, uh, you're, you're going to be joining potentially, right? Like there, there are some funds that, that are more focused on certain sectors like finance. Uh, you may not need a, a, a technical degree for that. There are investors who invest in the life sciences for which you really need a technical degree, a, a life science uh, sort of related degree. Uh, that's more, even more important. Yep. Um, and then, of course, you can be an entrepreneur, get funding, get to know uh, the firm, and then go in that way. I mean, in essence, whatever gets you close to the people who are making the hiring decisions at the firm is what is going to help you, right? Because, yep. because it, 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 it's really about knowing the people that, that you're going to work with and, and allowing them to, to see you. That's right. Um, I'll just bounce around. But one thing you said was, you know, MCNC had a big exit. What, what kind of company is that? Were they in the triangle? And I mean, yeah. when you think about, think about all the ecosystem building comments, like, well, we just need a big exit because it means something. Well, isn't that kind of a great example? And maybe talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, it, yeah, we have, I mean, the triangle has seen some pretty meaningful exits, but, um, but what is useful, I, I think is multiple things that we need in order to sort of, uh, to, 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 to make it more sustainable. Um, we have had pretty, pretty significant exits. This company that I, that I referred to was a company called Kronos. And, and it's a fairly common sounding name. This was a, uh, a MEMS technology, a, a microarray, basically a switch, a light switch, optic switch for telecommunications. Tiny, tiny little mirrors that would allow you to switch light. And it was used in telecommunication applications. Uh, JDS Uniphase was a company that bought it. Um, and it was at that time, this is again, this is probably late 90s. It was a 700 plus million dollar exit, 750 million exit. It, it's, it's an incredible story, which is very typical of the internet bubble phase. This company was developed at MCNC, uh, the technology, the core technology. It was, and I don't know all the exact details, but roughly I have it pretty, you know, it's, it's pretty good. Um, it went from first venture funding, you know, they spin it out, out of MCNC, first venture funding, and then to an exit all in a period of nine months. So you get venture funding and you get the exit. And the exit was $750 million. So um, MCNC owned a third of that company. Um, a lot of people made a lot of money really quickly, incredibly quickly. And $750 million in the late 90s, uh, again, I mean, that's 20, almost 25 years ago, uh, to, uh, was, um, was the, I think it was the biggest uh, sort of sort of venture back or private exit that way. Not, not a public company, but a, a private exit uh, at that time. I think, um, you know, I'm not sure whether there have been others that have sort of gone north of that. Um, but we, ha- we have had some good exits along the way. Um, the problem has been that these, the exits haven't necessarily stuck around. They made some people rich. But if that money is not recycled, if the resources are not recycled, if the entrepreneurs don't get recycled, if you don't get a bunch of uh, sort of wealthy individuals starting their new businesses or management talent doing it again, 
then then it doesn't it, the machine doesn't keep moving you know so we need it'd be great to have more public companies it would be great to have more people you know bringing in management talent and that talent being recycled to other companies that's what you want to see and, and, and numbers and, and i think we're that is one difference that i think we see i see between the early 2000s and what we have now in the triangle where you know, you have somebody like Joe Colopy, for example, successfully exiting a business and starting a bunch of other things and, and being an active investor. And you have uh, people like uh, Scott Wingo now doing, you know, three successful startups and and, and Judd Bowman, again, another three successful mm -hmm. startups. Um, you know, these people are investing, they are uh, creating companies, they're hiring people. So, so this is what you want to see. Now, I hope Pendo is another good success story. And, and, and from there, for example, uh, it creates wealthy management teams that are going to start new things, fund new companies, start new things. And, and, and then from there, the seeds kind of spread um, and, and it grows. Yeah. No, I, well, I mean, I guess I really was just saying more like basically, you know, MCNC had an exit and then started Idea Fund. Like that's just a very, you know, yeah, it's a great example of one of those good because I think oh, we hear a lot yeah. from a lot of communities like, oh, we just need more exits, we need more capital because oh, then there will be an ecosystem. It's like, but some people can't really connect the dots. Like, but really, there really oh, will yeah. be, and it's like, well, no, there will. Look at this one in the '90s before ecosystems were even a thing. A company exited. They started a venture fund and an endowment, and now that venture fund is still running to this day, making investments, growing, raising new funds. Idea, uh, uh, NC Idea is still a state-run program, or what? You can talk more about that. I yeah, know you guys yeah. are involved in that now, but um, and so that's a perfect example where, like, they were before ecosystems were such a big Brad Feld talk, right? It was like they they yeah. did that, you know, and they started exactly. these things. So good outcomes do beget more activity and more um kind of ecosystem ecosystem building well so, yeah, I, yeah yeah you're right i think we are a great example of an ecosystem before we were talking about ecosystems probably definitely before brad fell yeah. uh ha had a book uh, and talking about it um so if you think about what we are rtp where we live and rtp rtp in general uh i mean that is a perfect example without the research triangle park we would not have had a bunch of companies come in, we would not have had a bunch of entities, we would not have had MCNC, uh, NC idea would not have been created with you, you know, there were so many things that would be so different. Right? So, so yeah, I think somebody created the ecosystem that Research Triangle Park is, and from there, huge number of good things have happened. Um, yeah, we wouldn't, we would not be having this conversation if it wasn't for that. No, you, you, you're right. I think we, we don't stop to think about the good things that we have here, but the, the, the seeds of our, you know, where we are today were created, gosh, in the eighties, really in, in the eighties. So it's been 40 years in the making and it, it takes time. Uh, you know, people get impatient and we, we should be impatient because there's, there's other regions that have done a lot of good things pretty quickly too. And, and, and I think we are ready to take that next step, I think. Um, but, but we should be we should be proud of, of what the what the region has accomplished. Yeah. Do you think some of the regionality sort of focus starts to like dissipate now, like post COVID? You know, now that we are all yeah. kind of remote and distributed. I mean, there's still a value. Well, I'll just let you answer. But yeah, what do you think about that? Yes. Yes. I mean, I think COVID is going to change in a significant way how a lot of people do things. Uh, I th we think about that. We, I'm trying to think about that as a thesis and as an investment thesis. Uh, what are the impacts? What are the effects? You know, it's not obvious. It's hard to, to sort of try to predict the future or, or really try to observe the new, the, the new norms. Um, um, but there are some that are more obvious than others. Um, I think um, for me, for example, uh, it's just as easy to, to talk to an entrepreneur in Tel Aviv. I'm actually, uh, I'm actually uh, doing due diligence on a company in Tel Aviv, uh, as it is to talk to somebody in Chapel Hill, um, which is crazy. I, I mean, I would never, never would have said that uh, pre-COVID. Uh, you know, we have conversations with with companies in 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 Toronto one day, 
and then you know the next day you know it could be it could be seattle or raleigh and 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 the interesting thing is the same thing happens for entrepreneurs um you know it used to be that well of course you had to go to silicon valley to raise money at, you know if you exhausted your possibilities locally in a place like here there's not not that many the density of of, of investors uh you can exhaust i mean you can you can find you can find investors and, and after you're having a few conversations, what do you do? Well, you got to go to somewhere else. Well, you don't have to physically travel these days to do that. You don't have to spend money or, or time to take a trip to the West Coast. You can easily find investors all over the country, not only in the West Coast, but in the, in the Northeast and in, in the Midwest and, and in the South. Um, you see a lot of investors talking about moving to Texas. Uh, from California, a lot of investors moving to, 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 uh, to Florida. And it's because it doesn't really matter. The first conversations that we're having with entrepreneurs, they're not going to be in, uh, uh, in person anymore. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense because I don't have the time to, I mean, we look at 2000 companies to have to have a coffee meeting, get in the car, drive, have a coffee meeting and then leave and go to another meeting. That's just inefficient, right? I'm, I'm of course, I want to meet people that I am uh, doing business with, but um, but not the first meeting, for example. So so all of these things are changing the the sort of the boundaries and, and being able to communicate the way we are communicating. Just the, expect, the expectations are very different than they used to be. So it's going to create for more collisions and more interesting ways to uh, to raise money, do business, and and uh, and change sort of the 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 edges of what normally we used to be before. Um, speaking of, well, I guess maybe talk about what is the current thesis of kind of the fund and how's that evolved, you know, from like yeah. maybe over what X amount of time you choose, yeah. choose that time increment. Yeah, I think uh, I'll tell you about our existing thesis, maybe a little bit about the, the past thesis and maybe tell you about some of the thoughts in the future, uh, because they're, they're different, right? Like every fund. Mm -hmm. You, you, you kind of think about this a little bit more and then maintain some consistency. Early on, when we first started, we were just a seed and early stage venture fund, mainly focused on technology in North Carolina. This is our very first sort of uh, investment thesis. And, and, and it was you know, really talk to good people, creating innovative companies, plenty of, of great people, great ideas locally. And, and it was... It was fine because our, our first fund was a little bit smaller. Um, then we evolved to investing nationally. But of course, uh, the focus was always regional. The, when you are an early stage investor, you really can't stretch too far from your region because it doesn't make practical sense. Uh, plus, there's plenty to do here locally and, and, and regionally. But we consider ourselves at an early stage regional fund investing mainly in, uh, in uh, technology. Uh, we did a few, a few deals in the life sciences side, but really on the health, on the uh, healthcare IT or, or the medical device space. Um, and innovation and, and great management teams or great, at least great management potential was an, always an important consideration. Uh, you know, and as we grow and as we get uh, broader, uh, and bigger, not only in deals, but relationships and, and networks and think about uh, our next phase, there's a couple of themes that, that, that are important to us. Uh, one is uh, being a little more focused on, on our, our, our industries, our, our technologies. We added Chris Langford, as I said, uh, who was part of the Lowe's Ventures team. Well, he actually started the, the Lowe's Venture Fund and his, his expertise in, in networks and uh, is in investing around the home, uh, you know, building, uh, maintaining, transacting, uh, managing homes uh, and everything around that. It's actually a pretty wide ranging space, but you know, that sort of is the, our consumer side. Um, I, I have always been more of a B2B person and the enterprise is what uh, my partner John and I have focused more on uh, more recently. So uh, you can think about us uh, these days about 
thinking about the future of the home or the future of the enterprise and what that revolves. Um, and, and then another piece, so from a geographical component, you can think about us as a group that is interested in getting to know certain cities that you might consider um, secondary or second tier cities from a deal volume perspective, not from a deal quality perspective, but from a deal volume perspective. Um, we like places where there's not a whole lot of investors uh, looking around because it creates for a, a better dynamic. There, there's a, a, a better demand for, for, for investment deals. Places like, like Raleigh, like, like Durham, Chapel Hill, you know, the Triangle, places like Atlanta, DC, but also places like Denver, like Austin even. So think about uh, those, those interesting cities that are developing a lot of technology, but exclude Silicon Valley, exclude New York, Boston. And there are great, great uh, many places to, to look for deals. So from a geography perspective, and, and then the, the, the thing that we're, we're trying to think very carefully about is, is the people side of things. Diversity and inclusion has always been important to us, but never really have, have we thought about it in a sort of in an in a, in a, uh, in a overt way. But we are going to make it part of our strategy because we think that there's a great opportunity to make money by finding uh, uh, entrepreneurs who are, who are underserved, people who, who just don't typically get money because, because of their gender, because of the, the, their ethnicity, the color of skin, their sexual orientation, all of these things. Doesn't mean that I'm not going to invest in the uh, in the white guy with a great idea, but uh, there's many other people. Um, so we're, 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 diversity is going to be another way. It, so think about um, people, places, and, and industries are going to be an important piece. And what we're trying to think about is moving away. Uh, it, it's, it's moving away from what everybody else is doing, right? I mean, it's, it sounds pretty simple, but it's a contrarian approach. Look for where things are just being underserved and, 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 and go, go after that. So that kind of in general is, is how we would consider the, the future of what we're going to be doing. Oh, I, I was thinking about this earlier when you were talking about, oh, this podcast will live forever and, you know, how, you know, the thesis might be outdated, but how much flexibility do you have as the managing partner to alter and modify? I mean, I'm thinking there might be some future where you advance, you invest only in manufacturing, but that's because everything yes. is a robot, right? And like yeah. all tech is just like manufacturing is a proxy for all tech and innovation and stuff. I mean, just as an example. Yeah. But, yeah, how much but when we're thinking that? when we're thinking about a thesis, there's a couple of things to keep in mind, right? You you don't want to be changing what you do constantly because then it's very difficult for people to come to you to to send you the right deals, uh, and it's exactly. very difficult to make decisions. But you do need to react um, to to changes in the in, in technology, changes in, in in the environment, changes in business. Uh, you also you need to maintain a structure. You, you got to make money and you got to find ways to make money and react to, for example, things like COVID. When we were faced with COVID, we had to change the kinds of deals that we were doing. And for example, you know, reconsider whether we wanted to do deals in the services side, uh, which is what's a big core piece of what we were doing. Um, it, it, the services sector got hit pretty hard. And it was difficult to, to do certain things. So, so you do have to react. But when you get money from institutions and even from individuals, they give you money thinking that they have, they're allocating money to a particular asset class, a particular risk profile, a particular type of investment. And especially the larger investors, you know, if, if they think that I'm going to be investing in, for example, uh, technology and not the life sciences, um, because they have other investments in the life sciences as they try to manage their assets and create a certain level of diversity from a technical perspective. Well, I can't just change, uh, you know, willy-nilly my, my stage thesis or my industry thesis too much. Otherwise, I mess up their asset allocation. I mess up their diversification. So, so but, you know, so it's, it's a balance that we need to do. And, and then you we try to think about this from a sort of a five-year perspective. 
because that's going to be the investment period that we're going to typically have. So what is going to happen in the next five years that makes sense for us to invest? So we need to think about the future, but not too far into the future, because if we are, if we overshoot or if we go too early, if we're or overshoot, we may, we may be too late to certain investments. But if we go too early, then we'll be sitting on companies for 10, 20, 50, you know, 25 years and we don't get exits. So, so it's it's another balancing act when it comes to timing and and how long certain industries or certain technologies are going to take to mature.